Thank you very much for that um, kind, in, uh, <laughs> kind introduction, Bruce. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which this campus stands is a part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenape people. We, res we pay respect to the Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape di di diaspora. Archaeology and the art of reproduction <coughs> have both been identified as active agents in the process of 19th century imperialism, but seldom discussed as co-conspirators. In part, this is because it has only been within the last decade or so that the reproductions themselves of archaeological sites and artifacts have been theorized as autonomous sources that organize complex sets of information <coughs> that, shape and that shape the construction of knowledge. To invoke Bruno Latour, information is never transmitted without being transformed. In other words, representing artifacts is as much a practice as excavating them and needs to be uh, studied as such. So in this picture from 1906, we can see how staged the photograph is of social relations here in the imperial context. Here we have Turkish workers excavating the ruins of a Christian cathedral in Russian Armenia. In this presentation, I'm going to be looking at a specific type of archeological representation, that of ruins, which have long been stirring the imaginations of esthetes and philosophers. Sparked by the chance discoveries of Pompeii and Herculaneum in the mid 18th century, and although not the first ruins of significance, the two cities buried by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius inspired a worldwide fascination that made ruins central to a new way of imagining history. Uh, here is Karl Brulov's 1833 masterwork which features neoclassical bodies overwhelmed by the romantic theme of nature's power over humanity. This painting put Russian artists on the big stage, winning prizes at Paris and Petersburg, and it hung in the Academy of Arts. What though is ruin and how does this differ from rubble of buildings collapsing after centuries of neglect and exposure to the elements? A ruin is a monument from the past made relevant by the present. It is a fetishization of an imagined past. No less political, rubble is the detritus of a built environment that waits to be carted away, removed rather than remembered. From the Enlightenment, Denis de Dehaul began waxing about ruins as an emblem of transience that could abolish objective time. Edmund Burke evoked the sublime in the rough contours and impenetrable secrets held by ruins. And Edward Gibbon charted the rise and fall of the civilization that had left behind grandiose, but, it wrote, but eroded structures as testimony to long gone greatness. There was even a category of genre painters, the ruinistes, <clears throat> headlined by headlined by Jean-Baptiste Jean Perenasi and counted in Hubert Robert, who included Catherine the Great among her clients. Les Ruinistes painted absolutely sumptuous ruins, faux and, and fictitious in their grandeur, but nonetheless establishing a precedent of how ruins would be represented. And for all the science that archeology span would impose upon the crumbling buildings built for the lives of others, Ruins rarely lost their romantic appeal because they stood as testaments to a past and were of such imposing structures that they challenged views of the present. In the 19th century, ruins referred primarily to the remnants of the classical antiquity, Greece and Rome. Not itself a part of the Roman Empire, Russia was nonetheless expanding throughout the 18th and 19th centuries and absorbing territories that had been included in the Eastern Empire, ruled from Constantinople, after the so-called barbarians had conquered Rome circa 400 AD. The division between East and West also had critical religious component, Latin Catholicism versus Eastern Orthodoxy, the confession to which most ethnic Russians and their leaders belonged, Eastern Orthodoxy. It was this Byzantine empire that Russians could imagine as their own past. Moreover, 
Russia also had fragments of classical antiquities within its borders from the remains of Greek, Greek trading colonies along the Black Sea littoral and the Crimea, but these never dominated as Russian archeology. span Catherine the Great is the czar most closely associated with Imperial Russia's <coughs> symbolic alliance with classical antiquity. When Catherine hired the Italian arch architects to design neoclassical structures to commemorate the expansion of her empire, she included her own uh, faux ruin tower at Tsarskoye Silo. This is a Doric column that had sunk with age into the ground, built to memorialize one of several victories over the Ottomans that Islamic-based empire that had conquered Byzantium in 1453. Moreover, court poet uh, Gavril Dirajabin used the symbol of ruins, Razvalini, to comment on the political replacement of enlightened Catherine with her son, the tyrannical Paul. The faux and fictitious paintings dramatized one vision of history, but archeology span harbored pretensions of being an empirical science. So it had to draw a more scientific connection between past and present. I wanna be clear from the outset that the science of archeology span was deeply grounded in its own cultural and ideological foundations, which varied as much as the, which varied as much as the societies did in which it was evolving. But it first need to be separated from the art in which it had originated. In the late 18th century, First archaeologist, first archaeologist Johann Winkelmann had developed a methodology for studying the arts of antiquity. Constructing categories that allowed for a systematic comparison, Winkelmann successfully classified Greece and Rome into specific periods. He laid the groundwork for archaeologists to develop a new discipline because he had endowed material culture with a heightened interpretive significance. Winkelmann also established the visual component of archaeology as a central feature from the outset. And like any gentleman scholar of the 18th century, he privileged aesthetics above all else. The Russian Winkelmann, academic Alexei Aryenin, taught Russia's first course on archaeology at the Academy of Arts in the 1820s. Like his czar, <coughs> he preferred to edit reality in order to make it more pleasing to the eye. In 1830, Tsar Nicholas I, himself deeply engaged in how Russia's past could inform its present, commissioned Aliyanin student, student uh, Fyodor Solntsev to travel around and produce representations of antiquities using various artistic media. The son of a serf, Solntsev's years of peripatetic work resulted in the six volumes of Antiquities of the Russian State, chromolithographs largely of religious and autocratic symbols from medieval Russia and highly stylized for aesthetic appeal. Solnsev concentrated on objects, especially dress and icons, but the recreation here of the patriarchal courtyard, the former headquarters of the, Ortho of the Orthodox Church, indicates, uh, excuse me, initiates the, symb the symbiotic relationship between religion and ruins in the Russian empire. Archeology span had been developing piecemeal in Russia, principally through learned societies until 1859, when Tsar Alexander II established an Imperial Archeological Commission empowered to quote, search for objects of antiquity, predominantly relating to the history of the fatherland and the lives of the people who at one time lived in the space currently identified, currently occupied by Russia. The commission was attached to the Ministry of Court, which also included the Hermitage Museum. The Hermitage enjoyed the right of first refusal for all artifacts excavated from the digs that the commission sanctioned, and it put on display the favorite objects of imperial inclusion. The succession of czars who followed Nicholas also liked their artifacts to be pleasing to the eye, irrespective of scientific merit. Archaeology, though, needed to be able to make its artifacts visi visible in ways that would allow them to be grasped in the popular imagination. Their most pronounced capacity 
was to exoticize material cultures unearthed by excavations. That is to transform objects distance in both time and space into versions of a previously known thing capable of stirring both delight and desire. Inspiring an emotional connection, this imagery helped to ally the violence and displacement wrought by imperial expansion, and it played an essential role in the rhetorical strategy by which archaeology satisfied <coughs> colonizing objectives. These visuals provided a key medium for the imperializing state to convert the past of others into forms that the subject could recognize and appropriate for themselves. To repeat, the archeological commission was looking for objects of antiquity, predominantly relating to the history of the fatherland and the lives of the peoples who at one time lived in the spaces currently occupied by Russia. As that space expanded, so did Russia's antiquity. One of Tsarist Russia's most successful colonizing endeavors throughout the 19th century was the incorporation of Transcaucasia into the imperial domain. For all the vastness of the Russian empire, no area captured the imperial imagination quite like the Caucasus. Prometheus had been chained there, the eagle daily plucking out his liver for his sin of having brought fire to humans, and later, later Noah parked his ark on Mount Ararat. Sharing Orthodox Christianity in common had smoothed the absorption of Georgia in 1801 and Armenia in 1828, but these two ancient states still had to be thought of as belonging naturally within the empire. And because a portion of Armenia remained within the, the Ottoman Empire, the annexed, section, the annexed section was dubbed Russian Armenia, easing colonization forward. A crucial means by which imperial centers pulled peripheries into their, into their domains was through scientific exploration. Mikhail Vorontsov, Russia's viceroy of the Caucasus in the mid-19th century, was deeply committed to scientific expansion and what was an initial foray into deploying archaeology as an imperial practice. He sent a Lieutenant Kostner to explore and authenticate the ruins of Ani, the abandoned 10th century capital of Armenia. Because Ani was still in Ottoman territory, Varensov's bold move made plain Russia's ambitions. He was following up on a six volume study of the Caucasus made in the 1840s by Swiss explorer and archeologist uh, Frédéric Dubois. This created a precedent, that of usurping what Western travelers had documented, documented about lands that Russians considered historically theirs. Varensov's keenness to appropriate Ani can be visualized in his ruins. Costner spent 44 days sketching this unique collection of half destroyed buildings, victimized by centuries competing imperial powers and an earthquake in 1319. Then Varensov tasked Orientalist Marc Fe uh, Marie Felicite Brosse, trained in the languages of the Caucasus and a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences with making Ani accessible in the, imperial imagine, in the imperializing imagination. We can see how Brosset turned Ani into an artifact. He collected and interpolated the multilingual travel reports, maps, and scientific descriptions of the ruins. Then he employed an architect and a lithographer to make corrections that would ensure the authenticity of the reproductions. And he invited an artist from the academy to make adjustments to Kostner's efforts. The resultant two volume Ruin Dani offered a stunning selection of lithographs that accentuated the limits of descriptive language. Known in its heyday as the city of a thousand churches, Ani was now a romantic ruin, Diderot's evocative sublime, an emblem of transience abolishing objective time by affording an imaginary repeti uh, repetition of the past with an intensity nearly identical to the original sensations. These remarkable lithographs annul the need for words 
because the captions could not communicate what made the visual so suggestive. Rosé's work provided a particularly vi vivid example of how the reproduction can generate an emotional relationship to the artifact, a necessary component of the image of the imperial imaginary. Russian viewers desiring an Ani to be theirs. <clears throat> and this returns us to the question, what is a ruin? It's what a society claims as a connective monument between past and present. The, lith the lithograph though, was giving way to the photograph as photography began coming into its own. Significantly, photography shared with archeology span the promise of positivism, that 19th century faith in rational empirical knowledge. Photography assured a level of accuracy and reproduction that hoped to revolutionize representation. But no less than archeology, span its, its positivism was shaped by its practitioners. Nevertheless, clunky equipment and a process that involved the use of chemicals to etch images on some sensitive uh, metal sheets had kept photographers away during the early days of excavations in archeology. span Compare, for example, this etching of the ruins remaining of Bulgar, a center of Muslim trade and learning on the Volga near Kazan until decimated by Tsar Ivan the Terrible in 1552. This etching by Peter Svinin from 1839, complete with a contemporary character in the, for in the foreground, seeks the romantic connection, whereas the photo from 1870 goes strictly for verisimilitude. Mediating between the romance and the reality of the ruin, though, was the photogravure. A technical advance, <clears throat> advancement on the lithograph, it could still retain the contemplative aesthetic that softened the harsh contours of 19th century daguerreotypes. Furthermore, by producing images from negatives etched onto a metal, pl metal plate, the process combined easily with a printing press, which increased the, the circulation of visuals substantially. But photogravures were also pricey, which meant that they required subsidization and the sources of subsidies invariably harbored their own ad agendas. The first enterprise in which archaeology and the photogravure productively combined forces for imperial efforts came in the preparation for Russia's sixth archaeological archeo congress held in the Diesa in 1884. Financial subsidies came from Grand Prince Sergei Alexandrovich, youngest son of the recently assassinated Tsar Alexander II, and the Romanov with the deepest interest in archaeology. He backed Professor Nikodim Kandekov, a rising star in, in archaeological circles. And here we see uh, Kondakov with Chekhov and Yalta, kind of, a, this is a, a, an example of the kind of star quality that Kondakov uh, acquired by the end. Um, talk more about him later. Um, but uh, Sergei Alexandrovich uh, funded Kondakov on a trip to Constantinople where he would explore a number of Byzantine ruins remaining in the Ottoman capital. Like Rosé's etchings of Ani, Kondakov's trip reflected Russian encroachment into Ottoman territory for purposes of the reclamation of Russia's past, in which reproductions of ruins played a crucial role. Kondakov took a team of experts in reproduction with him, beginning with Jean Raoul, a French-born French photographer who had relocated to Odessa. Raoul was a particularly significant choice because of his own use of the lens to capture an imperialist gaze. Photographers like him were experimenting with different ways to envision sceneries from landscapes bereft of inhabitants to snapshots of ethnic types, pictures of anonymous individuals posed to represent essentialized social and ethnic classifications. So Kondakov and Raoul are, uh, uh, understand what they want to do, what, what their mission is, and they want to uh, work together to accomplish this, uh, the reproducing of these ruins for 
um, in Constantinople for Russian purposes. Kondekov's entourage also included a draftsman and a noted watercolorist, which underscored the assumption that archaeology required visuals. The volume that appeared in 1887, ornamented with 50 full page photogravures, displayed in full creative displayed in full creativity, made possible by their collaborations. <clears throat> now, here we see a watercolor of the sarcophagus at the Church of St. Irina. Combined with Kondakov's interpretive text, the volumes unites word and image in a rhetorical stratagem for reclaiming Byzantium, the origins of orthodoxy for Russia. Kondakov's illustrators made the orthodox religious past palpable in no small measure by keeping the Islamic presence invisible. By, curing up, by conjuring up images familiar from medieval chronicles, while also erasing part of the present, these reproductions had profound political implications. The variety of media helped the archaeologists to, well, mediate. This is a photograph of the ruins of the Hippodrome in Constantinople. Again, part of the, this is all part of the Kondakov's um, mission. The photo of the Palace of Porphyrogenitus, erasing the Ottoman presence, going back to the Byzantine presence. And here we have the Studios Monastery, and this is a nicely touched up photograph as we're playing back and forth what, you know, what's the best, the most effective way of reproducing the various media. Uh, this is a drawing of the uh, Silevirsia gates, and what you can assume is that the photograph didn't come out uh, nearly as clearly as some of the other ones that I've just showed you, so the, um, the draftsman had to take over here. And this one is a nice example of the perils of flash photographer, fog photography because Raul could not take his uh, camera indoors to photograph the interiors of a lot of these buildings because the flashes would uh, obviously reflect on them and on the, the frescoes themselves so you couldn't see. So another reason that you need a variety of people schooled in the different ways of media representation. These extraordinary reproductions of ruins exercised the full force of the archaeological visualizations as a medium of imperialism. The Kondakov venture took a ma major archaeological step forward in advancing the notion of translatio imperi, according to which the Russian Empire viewed itself as a continuum of the fallen Byzantine Empire. At the crux of this lay the religious inheritance of orthodoxy, which also provided the cultural key to incorporating Transcaucasia within into the Russian Empire. Enter Praskovia Uvarova, widow of the father of Russian archaeology, Alexei, and whose personal acquaintances included Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich. Having first traveled to Georgia in 1879 on an expedition with her husband, she became complete, completely smitten with the region. Beginning in 1886, she organized a series of excursions throughout the Caucasus, which resulted in 14 volumes published between 1888 and 1916, all under her ed editorship. The framework was familiar. Collect materials that had been written and reproduced by others, then correct and expand upon previous efforts while also adding new analyses and visuals. Praskovia's greatest infatuation came from the ruins of the monasteries that had dotted the area. And like Kondakov, she by and large excluded the Muslim present. The fourth volume, an excursion that Praskovia herself had undertaken, produced the most magnificent reproductions. She traveled throughout Abkhazia, itself a target of Georgia's colonizing ambitions in search of Christian monuments. 
Lovarova does not name her photographer, only that he was sometimes too tired and too weak to scale heights that did not daunt her. Transformed into alluring photogravures, these reproductions of massive and abandoned stone buildings were photographed repeatedly from angles that obligate the viewer to defer to their majesty. Uvaro's uh, homage to the Christian Caucasus added a markedly expressive element because her photogravures captured a spirituality that, while ostensibly softening her political agenda, made it all the more potent because of its emotive component. This image of the Safarsky Monastery, a complex of churches dating from the 10th through the 15th centuries, positions it precariously along a, a gorge, but unmolested by the surrounding forest. And here we have an example of the Kaliskura Tower where nature is in fact overwhelming the structure. This is an example of the turn of the century sensibility of ruins articulated by Georg Simmel in 1907. Although the ruin seems to signal the revenge of nature on the strivings of human agency, in reality, the ruin refers us to this, returns us to the source of energy, to the core of ourself. Implicit in these Christian monuments is the notion that they had survived the onslaught of Russia's enemies from the Mongols to the Ottoman Turks. Therefore, the time had come for Russia to reclaim and restore these ruins. Here is an interior of a church on the Mzibu River from Uvarova's collection. And <clears throat> this slide of the monastery at uh, Zarzum, you can see how the photographer, you can see by the uh, individuals in the foreground, how the photographer is manipulating uh, the angles uh, in capturing this, these, mon these pictures. And photography also allowed the archeologists and Uvarova here to place themselves at the site in the story. These photogravures successfully revere, revere both the obstinacy of the original structure and the force of the natural world intertwined with it. Moreover, they diminish the positivism of both archeology span and photography by making both time and space ethereal rather than absolute categories. The next archeological excursion to the Caucasus from the early 20th, 20th century moved away from Praskovia's evocation of the religious sublime offering its, its place the surety of realism. Nikolai Marr, whose name some of you might recognize as the linguist who would one day become the personification of the perversions of Stalinist <laughs> science, was a young linguist sent to Ar Armenia first in 1892 to counterbalance the growing presence of Western archeologists in the region. Ani, so memorable from Rosset's lithographs had fallen into Russian territory as a result of the Russo-Turkish War of 1877. Mar returned in 1904 with, <clears throat> you can see the multicultural uh, group that he's brought back with him to reinvent or to recapture uh, Ani. So <clears throat> he's got, uh, and uh, Mar's objective is to reconstruct the, de the devastated city of Ani in situ. That is, he wanted to turn the dig site itself into the museum rather than sending the artifacts back to the hermitage. And here's his Armenian photographer, Avram Vur. Mar turned the lone mosque left standing into an exhibition for the display of, art of objects, but the real museum would be the city itself which he intended to resuscitate. Notably, the appropriation of the mosque, <clears throat> possibly the first in the region and reportedly still in use, was yet one more erasure of Islam. And what you can see here is um, the uh, Brosse's uh, lithograph of the interior from the 1860s with um, photograph 
of what Mar has done to it to try to turn it into a, a display case. Photographer Avram Wurz's initial role was as documentarian, the chronicler of archeological activities. Using before and after, a before and after layout, what appeared to be in the first shot an undistinguished hillock would become manifest in the second to reveal a courtyard with the remnants of residence. <coughs> there we have a <coughs> photograph of this ex uh, from of the, the uh, excavation in progress. Although barely comprehensible, these grainy photos nonetheless celebrated the power of archaeology to recover the past. Moreover, the visuals helped Marr to solicit the private funding upon which he de depended because the government subsidy of 950 rubles was hardly sufficient for his ambitions. Marr turned to the um, affluent Armenian di diaspora for more generous support and the photos proved to them that their money was being well spent. Uh, and here we have uh, some interior and exterior shots and his decorative details. But these visuals also heralded a political problem, the burgeoning contestation between Russian imperialism and Armenian nationalism. And <clears throat> this is one of the uh, growing popular uses of photography in these ruins. This is a stereos stereoscopic uh, uh, vision of Ani. These were popular selling around the empire. Another way of appropriating Ani for Russia. The success of excavating Ani uh, in situ resulted in other attempts to recreate the ruins of the museums, the ruins as the museums themselves both with equally contested imperialized identities. This is a greeting, the Greek trading colony of Olvia, founded in the seventh century BCE, where the Bug River flows into the Black Sea, uh, excavated by Boris Farmakovsky in 1910. And this fortress overlooking Lake Van in Anatolia, the fortress was built circa at the ninth to the seventh centuries BCE. This is where Mar and Arbele began excavating in 1916, when this area fell under uh, Russian, the, the, fell into the, the domain, the control of the Russian army on the Caucasus front during World War I. The single most striking artifact that Mar unearthed in Ani was the discovery of a nearly seven foot statue of King Gagik I, who <coughs> uh, reigned in the 11th century, found in 1906, the solitary statue found in the excavation. Mar was particularly taken with Gagik's turban, which he interpreted as a Christian king wearing Muslim headgear, a practice that he considered common for the era and which provided evidence that he sought to explain that Mar was seeking to explain a benign multicultural imperialism possible in Ani. Rather than being sent to the Hermitage, Gagik was fastened sideways to the wall in the Ani Museum behind a glass case. And <clears throat> this black and white photo of Gagik, produced by Verur in his role of documentarian, helped to lure the curious to Mar's city museum. It fashions a trace of Gagik's existence, exoticized, but not tethered by either time or space. Images of Ukrainian ruins, which roll so painfully off my tongue today, also figured into the relationship between archeological reproduction and Russian imperialism. The contemporaneous rubble around the beautiful city of Kiev underscores the heartbreak of this city's history. A series of prints from 1651, discovered by a student of Kondakov's in 1905, captures its tragic past. Student Smirnov sent these prints to the 13th Archaeological Congress in Yekaterinoslav, present day Dnipro. The only information Smirnov had was that they were from the Kiev album of Prince Radzuel, a collection of prints of 
<clears throat> the ruins of Kiev in 1651, when the former capital of Rus was occupied by the Lithuanian prince Janusz Radziwill during the Khmelnytsky uprising. The artist was only later identified as Abraham uh, von Westerveld, a Rotterdam engraver whom Radziwill had brought with him to capture the events. Printmaking artists from the Netherlands, whose names included Hieronymus Bosch, Peter Bruegel the Elder, Rembrandt van Riem, had revolutionized the medium. Teaching the viewers new ways of reading these Dutch prints drew new kinds of narratives, social and secular, and circulated throughout Europe. Radziwill left no ex explanation for why he had brought Westerwald along, but the popularity of the medium suggests that he nursed ambitions of having, <coughs> of being able to tell his own tale of conquest. Now, Westerwald's Prince of Kiev are strongly, or better still, strangely evocative of Hieronymus Cox's Prince of Roman ruins from a century earlier, replete with the flora spouting uh, from the detritus of stone buildings, skies filled with birds, and people, sitting, people simply living amid the ruins. With no immediate context, they defy signification. That these prints were never taken up for further discussion <clears throat> suggests a lack of appetite to deal with the immediate context, content, Lithuanian content, the Lithuanian the Lithuanian conquest of Kiev. And here we have some more of Westerveld's amazing prints. And here's the Golden Gate, which I'm sure a number of us have seen the uh, contemporary rep uh, reproductions of it. Here's the uh, Westerveld's image of it, reproduction of it. Nor have these prints since been analyzed since uh, Smirnov first discovered them, with the slight exception of the print of the print that he made of uh, Yaroslav the wife's family. And this this is on the uh, this uh, print is uh, a reproduction of uh, uh, the 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 fresco of Yaroslav's family in San Sofia, which again some of you might have seen. The curiosity, the curiosity here has been in identifying Yaroslav's children because his daughter Anna was married to the king, married the King Henri the I of France in 1051. The next archaeological uh, congress held in Chernihiv in 1908, note the Ukrainian settings for this, presented visualizations of Cossack ruins that crossed the theoretical line into rubble. Architect Fyodor Gornostayev and photographer Pyotr pa Pavlov had been commissioned to chronicle the ruins remaining of buildings commissioned in Chernihiv province by the last hetman of the Zaporozhian Cossack host, Kirill Razumovsky, who was Uvarova's great uncle-in-law. Although archaeologists had agreed upon 1700 as the end date for their professional scope, the visuals of these ruins from the buildings of the mid 18th century recorded the demise of the Hetmanate, a vestige of Ukrainian independence. Pavlov's pictorials and Gornosayev's words threw into bold relief the power of photography to present as objective, realistic reproductions that were in, in reality empowered by latent ambiguity. Pavlov's visuals fashioned a past that lay in tatters. On the one hand, he fetishized the recognizable and tangible detritus of Ukrainian splendor, or, or, of Ukrainian aristocratic splendor, ruins that fitfully recalled when the territory held vestiges of autonomy within the Petrine imperial structure. Neoclassical by architectural design, all the famous Italian architects uh, of the area of uh, Zarevda Elizabeth's court had worked on them. These crumbling buildings rehearsed Gibbon's tale of decline and fall. Appointed Hetman uh, by Elizabeth because uh, his brother Alexei was her favorite, Kirill had established a residence at Baturin, site of numerous uh, important events in Cossack history. Elizabeth granted him a second stronghold 
Pachep, a region once under the control of Hetman Ivan Mazepa. A third estate, Lalici, <coughs> had belonged to P, uh, Count Peter Zavodsky, also of Cossack heritage, and who had become a favorite of Catherine the Great. However, by the time of the Gorenstaev excursion, its disrepair was such that Jewish merchants from Gommel had purchased the estate with the intent of turning it into a factory. Now, the Kondakov Rual visuals had brought, into, brought to the fore an inspirational past, one with the potential to efface the problems of the present. The Gorenstaev Pavlov pictures evoked the psychological as well as the literal meaning of ruins, that is deteriorating into rubble. The photos of Constantinople had witnessed the persistence of an ancient Christian civilization weathering the Islamic slot, whereas Pavlov's contributions to the narrative of Ukraine revealed crumbling <coughs> columns of abandoned majestic structures, collapsed staircases from which grandees had descended into galas, bricks, stone about, bricks strewn about where stoves had fired up feasts barely more than a century earlier. Commenting on how the modern sensibility should preach architectural remains, Simmel rude that the ruin strikes us so often as tragic because destruction here is not something senselessly coming from the outside, but rather the realization of a tendency inherent in the de deepest layer of existence of the destroyed. Pablo's photographs of the rubble underscore how the deepest layer of Cossack existence had been destroyed, photos evocative of deliberate neglect rather than nostalgia. That Ukrainian President Viktor uh, Yushchenko, restored by Turin in 2009, testifies to the unambiguous na national identity inherent in these ruins. To conclude, <coughs> we now return to King Gagik because Vru's photos found, its, uh, found itself a considerably more momentous historical play than <coughs> Mar had ever imagined. And this is again, another sign of the Russian army able to re uh, return when they, the, <coughs> during World War I, uh, when, they were, when the Russians were having success along the, uh, success along the Transcaucasian front. And back to Gagik, as, okay, I can get this minute. By 1918, when World War I began turning into a civil war in the Russian empire, catastrophe struck the on the artifacts. One of Mars teams loaded Gagik and the other objects aboard a train bound for the newly established <coughs> uh, Archaeological Institute for the Caucasus in Tbilisi. The rail wagon van vanished en route. Gagik, floating with Fearly in this photo, announces his presence here and only here. Now this photograph performs double duty. First is a testament to the necessity of photography to, to archeology, span because pictures can save at least the contours of what nature can destroy. Second, this photo poses a potential counter argument to those post-colonial theorists who would keep material artifacts strictly within the cultural milieu in which they took shape. Should Gagik had instead have been shipped to the Hermitage where he could still be standing safely under the gaze of all, <clears throat> even though that would have relocated an Armenian king to the Imperial capital, the massive archeological destructions wrought, uh, <clears throat> wrought by Russian bombings in Syria and Ukraine raised this question anew. So, okay, uh, what I have, okay, sorry. What I have over this is a recording of the old song, what would I do with just a photograph to tell my troubles to? So it's like, what, what happens when all we have left of the ruin is the photograph of Gagik? Okay, thank you very much. Great, so we welcome, um... We want to thank Louise for the great talk. Uh, we welcome any thoughts, comments, or questions, and uh, 
we can start off with, with our own, but I am going to walk to my laptop now being set up and uh, also we'll take questions in the chat if anyone wants to raise their hand. Please, Anne. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ann O'Donnell, and I, I teach Soviet history here. Um, this is very interesting. Thank you. I'm sorry I was late, so I might have missed if you already said this. Forgive me if, if you did, but I was wondering if you might comment on the prevalence of foreign uh, photographers uh, in the project of documentation. And you, you gave us so many wonderful names and um, I'm wondering how these people were hired and where they came from. And uh, Actually, that's a really good question. And um, <clears throat> I've written on this elsewhere. In fact, most of them are Russian photographers. Raul is one of the exceptions to this role. And the development of the photographer, the uh, photographer studios in Moscow that um, Praskovia Uvarova used extensively were also a lot of Russian photographers. So Vrur counts as an Armenian photographer. And uh, Mar was very, very uh, intent upon bringing Georgians and Armenians, people who were from the area, who would, he thought would understand the area better, and of course, share his sense of multicultural imperialism better, uh, just as Kondakov used Raul, because Raul was in Odessa with him, but also had an established in a reputation for the kinds of types that he used, that he, you know, he, he had the same kind of imperial vision also that Kondakov did. And then there was, perhaps this was not a French person, but um, Marc Marie Brosse. Oh, Brosse. Yeah, Brosse was he was French. He was a member of the Academy of Sciences in the 1860s. I can imagine. Yeah. 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 Um, but that itself was not unusual. And his he was a member of the Academy of Sciences because although French, he was a linguist in the language of the Caucasus, and that's what mattered. That was what made the difference there. Um, because it was, it was, yeah, it was very hard to find people who, who knew and eat the languages of the Caucasus. Yeah. Bruce can still, <laughs> then, now and then. So, um, yeah. so that was the connection. You no, know, I just find it really interesting, I, especially, you know, obviously this is a presentation that had a lot of contemporary resonance, as you, as you noted at the end. And I find it interesting in terms of the um, possibilities that it suggested for exploring um, Russian imperialism within this kind of cosmopolitan mm -hmm. milieu and what's, how that project is functioning at this moment. That's what I was noticing as I was reading, as I was yeah, looking no, at the visuals. We um, can go in different directions. We have, uh, I, I, uh, but I want to draw attention online. We have uh, up uh, Ilya Malakov uh, will be our next question. And I believe uh, Sasha can bring him on. Yes, thank you very much. And actually, I have two uh, small comments. In the beginning, you showed a picture by Hubert Robert, mm -hmm. so ruined landscape. And actually, Russia has one of the most, uh, the biggest collections of Hubert Robert, and he was especially beloved by Russian aristocracy. And um, he was also admired by Denis Diderot. And Diderot once said that if you want to make a palace a place of interest, you have to ruin it. And actually, the picture you showed, it is the Grand Gallery of Louvre. And Robert was the second director of the Louvre Museum. And he imagined it as a ruin. And actually, a lot of Russian architects uh, studied Robert pictures. And one of them was Sholtovsky. And he was born in 1860s. Uh, and he died in 1950s. So he worked in Russian Empire and in Soviet Union. And he was one of chief Stalinist uh, architects. And then he projected his buildings. He aimed them to look like ancient Roman and Greek ruins in next uh, 2000 of years. And so Robert was very important for those prints. And I have one more comment about the ruined tower in Sarskoe Selo. And actually, according to Cameron, the architect, uh, the top of this Doric uh, ruined column, there is a small rotunda. Mm -hmm. And it has sharp arcs, and its form is remin reminiscent of uh, Turkish minarets, so towers of the mosques. And so rotunda is very little, and the Doric column is huge. 
And this shows um, the thickness of Ottoman Empire. And next to the ruined tower in Sarskaya Selo, there is a, um, a cathedral, little one, and it is a small replica of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. And so this Sarskaya Selo Park, uh, landscape park, is a political statement. And the Catherine had uh, her grandson named Constantine, so that uh, he may be linked to the next ruler of Byzantine Empire. And so then she crushes the Ottoman Empire. Thank you very much for Thank you. providing That's, more information. That was very interesting. Um, I uh, do you want to follow up to that in any way, or is that okay? No, I mean, I, <clears throat> yeah, no, thank you. I mean, you, you just great. supplied more information about the uh, images that I simply introduced. Thank you. Great, then uh, we thank Ilya. And I have a question or two I want to ask, just because I want to make sure I follow this. There are parts that I, got, I, I think are quite great that I haven't seen before, and I, but I just want to make sure that I have it. Okay. So initially, I thought you said that these were the images were both for kind of conquerors and conquered. Mm -hmm. But as the talk went on, I get the sense that they're mostly for audiences of these readers of these books in the imperial capitals in Petersburg and Moscow and so forth. That it's really for the Russian imaginary of the imperial state. Yes. Great. Okay. So. Moving on from there, then, I was curious about, so the idea is, and I apologize if you said this, or if I just, that the idea is that the assumption, as I took it, is that viewers would somehow take satisfaction in these images of the fallen ruins of Armenia and Georgia, because the people themselves and the civilizations themselves had kind of fallen to Russian power. Yes. And the Russian archaeologists are able to, um, <clears throat> you know, the connection between the reproductions that the people that, that lets the people see what what is there now, and uh, lets it uh, allow it to be restored. You know, this this puts Russia back in the position of like Mar at the very end of restoring Ani, bringing it back into Russia. Right, right. So the assumption of restoration is implicit in mm -hmm. because that's so interesting, right? Because that differs from the classic European sense. It's very different, Russian archive. Yes. Great. Sorry, okay. continue. Uh, yes. No, 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 Sorry. Yeah. This is exactly what I wanted to hear because I was thinking initially of the, the appeal and the fetishization of the ruin itself as something which has fallen in order to insist on a certain kind of a tenure, mm -hmm. right? the way that everyone's obsessed with this kind of global story that Greece begat Rome, Rome begat the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment begat the Enlightenment. And so here we're not just looking at tenure, we're looking at the act of, of other conquered peoples having fallen. And then being brought up. Yes. And um, Russian, I mean, I, I, uh, there's been a lot of uh, attention was first focused uh, by Westerners on the Greek colonies in, uh, as you know, Greek antiquity in Russia with New Russia and the, the discoveries there. These, the Greek, the Greek, um, <coughs> uh, the Greek excavations there, the Greek sites there are never, never central to Russian archaeology as it develops. They're much more into, they go immediately into what's Russian. They go immediately into the empire. And so it's kind of cool to have some of this stuff on display in the hermitage, but it's not what Russian archaeology is about. It, 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 as you said, takes a very different path than European archaeology that becomes visible in the, uh, these re reproductions that I was talking about, as well as the excavations themselves. Great. Well, then look, the last thing, and I don't want to Labor this because I love actually I think this is I hadn't thought of this before so I really appreciate it. The do we start to see therefore the kind of the eventual before and after images that one normally associates with restoration or did did that ever come in the nineteenth century or was it the rest of the what, what was it the notion of the promise? It's the notion of the promise, and it's the notion in in uh, in Uvarova's sixteen volumes of the Caucasus, we can see that starting to come into fruition. But of course, everything changes after nineteen sixteen, and so um, that it doesn't come out that way. But it's definitely moving in that direction, and you can see it if you leaf through her um, her visuals. And these her photographers are clearly clearly. Uh, cognizant of what they're doing, how they're framing these pictures, what they're doing with the photograph viewers when she gets them back to Moscow. Great. And it is about restoration, not just the ruin. 
and and then although I can fully understand the magical purchase of Christianity here uh -huh. and the emphasis on Armenia and Georgia at the expense of other parts or even northern Iran and so forth uh -huh. later, but um, is it? Do you think it's really just a preference for people that Uvadra had people such as Uvadra had for going to the Christian areas, or the assumption that mad mad metropolitan viewers would prefer to see Christian areas? Because in other respects, one could imagine we do want because you did use the phrase, and this is what Anne picked up on earlier. I think right this benign cosmopolitan mm -hmm. experience. One would imagine then that there might be an embrace of a fallen Islam, the best kind of Islam. To that audience might be a fallen one, and therefore one that would be restored in a Russian image. This is one thing that Arbeli does and Mar do after the revolution, because then they're much more interested in bringing Eastern artifacts to the Hermitage as well. They're much more interested in incorporating, you know, what you're saying, it broadening it beyond the Christian Caucasus. Um, so there, it, it gets back to their excavations at Ani and Van. You know what they consider archaeology, but this is a post um, post 1917. And Mars, one of the Mar Formakovsky, who was digging at Olvi as well, they're very, very influential and supportive of getting rid of the Archaeological Commission because they felt that the, the Archaeological Commission was, it, it, you know, it's the source of sanctioning for excavations. And so you need the permission from them to dig someplace. Uh, and to get you know the support needed, and um, they were very frustrated with the conservatism at the archaeological commission. And people like Uvarova, what do you want to look at besides old monasteries? You know what, what's important about that? You know, like look at the look at the pictures of these, Bruce. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Well, no, and look, there's such a there's a classic kind of mise en scène that's put in every single mm -hmm. one of these photographs. Yeah. The emphasis on columns, etc. Okay, I will stop. And let's just make sure before um, any before any of us in the room keep going on, if anyone in our Zoom room would like to um, follow up, let me just check. Okay. Got it. Well then look, I just want to ask one last question, which is um, and then I'll uh, you know, and surely I will stop because that's not why people are staying up. <laughs> This is, you know, you're taking on a classic story that will be a popular one with Bridgers. This is terrific. And a, a key point of 19th century and imperial rule. I like all of that. What are the parts? You've done everything you're supposed to do for a talk, right? Okay. Which is, you've come, you've given beautiful material, you've given a main point and an argument. So I just want to ask the kind of classic thing, because this is not finished work. What is there here that's that you're still working on or you're struggling? Or your or the bothers you about this material. What's unresolved about this for you? Are there are there evident are there are there other kinds of ruins that you don't know what to do with yet? Are there are there authors who aren't quite fitting this thing? Because it's it makes sense to me. It's great. It's perfect. But while you're here, while you're here, okay, well, what, what do you okay, use, this... what do you want our help with? <sighs> Save me. <laughs> there's a lot. See, there's a lot. And the, the sad thing is, is that this is what my um the book that I'm writing on this development of archaeology looks like. I just keep tripping over these really fascinating things. I've written hundreds of pages, none of which is reaching the kind of conclusion uh that that pulls it all into the same story. So the I so I really can't answer that question because then I could go to uh some of the other things that I'm working on, have been working on, and I don't have uh, you know, the personalities of them, the, and the whole, the thing that I need to start working on the most now is archaeologists imagine Ukraine, because that was a really important issue at the time. And the last archaeological congresses were held in, in specifically in Ukraine, and Ukrainian archaeologists are very involved in um, excavating their past. And so, you know, I, I got so many more questions than I do answers. I, and and I didn't want to yeah, no, no, no. I, I don't have I don't have control of my research. This is such great Simply research. stated, I do not have control of my research. I thought I knew what, what I wanted to do, but it didn't turn out that way at all. Well, and as I've learned from many years in working with our archaeologists in the same department, they themselves are very self-conscious of how arbitrary they're taking tiny microscopic mm -hmm. portions of what they know to be evidence of broader civilization. They're doing it 
in weird mixes of intention and convenience and, and viability, and they're trying to generalize from that. Mm -hmm. so, the top part. So that's that's part of what I was asking. Well, it's part of the thing that keeps the, the uh, project exciting for me to keep uh, research and keep working on. Okay. Then, absent anyone bothering us in uh, the uh, Zoom room, we might then just thank our speaker. Good. We're going to thank our speaker for coming and joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Us.